the archive uh, came into existence, as Philip mentioned, um, almost 50 years ago. In fact, 1973 is the year the project really began. Um, before I say a little bit more about that, uh, I'll let um, Kipling's five, four honest serving men, what and where and why and who, uh, be my guide. Um, the who part obviously involves a little bit of autobiography. So in 1973, a year after I had come down from Cambridge with uh, uh, a degree in philosophy, uh, I started postgraduate studies at the University of London. And uh, I had just read uh, that month, in fact, that I went up to begin my postgraduate studies, the big black book, the telephone director, as it's sometimes known, which had just appeared, that's Misner, Thorne and Wheeler. Um, I, it made a profound impression on me. Uh, one of the most important ways in which it impressed me was it impressed me with the depth of my own ignorance of the mathematics and physics, which I would have needed to study it properly. Uh, and that was something which I felt a very urgent desire to remedy. So for the next two years, I plunged into taking courses at the University of London, mostly outside my own uh, field of postgraduate studies uh, in uh, the, the relevant background, particularly in general relativity and cosmology and in uh, other areas of physics and mathematics. And in the course of those studies, uh, I got into the habit, and initially just occasionally, and as a favour to other people, uh, of recording seminars with the permission, of course, of the participants and the organisers. Uh, initially in London itself, and particularly at King's College, um, which at that time was a very, very much a commanding world centre for study in, in general relativity, um, and, but also in Oxford and in Cambridge. Uh, it was an extremely fortunate time because, uh, of course, Stephen Hawking was then in the middle of doing uh, some of his most spectacular work at Cambridge at the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics. And uh, Roger, of course, was, um, well, had already cut his teeth in the previous 10 years, um, but was doing fascinating things in Oxford. Um, not only in general relativity and cosmology in his seminar uh, on those topics, but also in the seminar on twister theory. So I started recording these things and got into the habit of doing so. The project gradually expanded and extended um, my own field of log. I was actually doing a thesis in, in modal logic and in uh, philosophical logic, which I'm afraid rather got neglected as a result of uh, being sidetracked so much into GR and cosmology and into the history and philosophy of science generally. Um, but, but as, as I say, I, I also started recording quite a lot of material in what was then still my own official field of study. Uh, initially, most of the recordings were made in the UK, in London, Oxford and Cambridge, um, in one or two other places, occasionally like Southampton and Leeds, but for the most part, London, Oxford and Cambridge was the, the centre um, of my activities. Um, and then later, uh, as time went on, I managed to get other people involved in this project and they agreed to record uh, interesting conferences and seminars which were taking place in other places. Uh, notably in Germany in 1974, there was a big international summer institute and international logic colloquium in Kiel, uh, which was one of the first big international conferences that I attended. Um, and um, as time went on, like Topsy, the whole project you know, grew and grew. Uh, the um, situation today is that the archive, of course, with the help of many, many helpers, uh, in various countries um, has grown to the extent that, although I'm not quite sure if Philip's right in saying that it's the largest archive of its kind in the world, it's certainly pretty large. It contains some 57,000 recordings uh, and uh, about 250 document boxes of associated documentation in the shape of original handouts, contemporaneous lecture notes, um, correspondence, emails, things like that. Um, the it became clear quite some while ago already 20 years ago that this was a far too 
bigger project really for one person to handle. Um, so I decided that the, the collection, obviously, which I wanted to go on being of value to researchers, um, you know, beyond my lifetime, needed to find a permanent home. And I'm very happy to record that thanks to the persistent uh, efforts of Philip and his associates uh, and to the Quantum Gravity Society, that's now been achieved. So uh, that's a little bit of background. Um, the other question I'd like to ask before I just turn to a short uh, series of, 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 of clips um, to actually physically present the appearance of the archive and show people a little bit of what is involved in the project of its digitization uh, that I should mention is that uh, it's been officially given in the um, documents which legally governed its acquisition by the Quantum Gravity Society, the name of the Michael Wright Collection. Um, I always think the word collection, uh, to me, always summons up uh, the impression of something a little frozen and static and inert. Uh, I always think of stamps in a stamp albums arranged along a shelf or collections of minerals or butterflies in uh, display cabinets in the Natural History Museum. I hope very much that this archive is going to be something considerably more interactive and dynamic than that. Uh, and one reason that I think uh, that is that uh, really at the heart of the archive, particularly in the last 25 years or so now, um, has been a series of, the French use the term rencontre, um, the project for um, carefully prepared, uh, no, very, very thoroughly researched and carefully prepared um, encounters with a single leading figure um, whose work has been of particular significance for the development of uh, particularly the foundations of mathematics. I should say that the archive deals with foundations of mathematics as well as with um, the physics of uh, general relativity and cosmology. Um, it, it actually deals with several other topics, but those are the two which have been very much the center of my own um, interest and activity and focus. And since 1988, we have been organizing um, two or three times a year, a, a series of encounters, um, panel discussions, usually with five or six of um, people on one side who are close colleagues and uh, who are very familiar with the work of the of the subject of the of the rencontre, and then with the person who is going to be the the central subject of the discussions and of the uh, of, and, and of the debates over the week or so um and these have lasted if anything from seven to ten days and the material which has been gathered as a result of that i certainly do regard as some of the most important material in in the archive and the thing by which i think it should be judged uh, that material and some of the other recordings of what people have said to one another in seminars and over coffee uh, that have not always found their way into print I, I think uh, provide enough raw material going forward for for many future rencontre discussions workshops and uh, uh, what the French call group de travail um, I think since I've already spoken I think for the best part of 10 or 15 minutes, uh, that probably the sensible thing now, I apologize that these remarks are so very ill prepared because as I say, I, I was expecting to be able to come and deliver them in person, um, would be for me just to show a little bit physically of what um, the archive involves, the appearance of the archive. So to do that, I'd like to share my screen. Um, let me see, I hope I'm doing the right thing. Um, I should be able, I hope, to, yes, do, do people see uh, a screen shot in front of them with uh, the depiction of a whole array of display, of, uh, of storage cabinets? Not yet. Oh, you don't. Oh, that's a bit worrying. Um, uh, I thought I had done exactly the right thing to get it to come up on the screen. I appear not to have done. Um, I'm wondering if, oh, hang on, wait a minute, I think, can somebody do a screen share at that end? That may be what I need to do. 
working on it. Sorry about this. Oh, does that help? Unfortunately, we're not. We're still seeing you, Michael. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that is unfortunate. I agree. <laughs> no, no, no comment there. Um, well, hang on. Let me see. We rehearsed this, and I thought it. Uh, yes, well, they say perfect rehearsal always means a catastrophic first night. Um, let me see. Uh, well, I've opened the first image, which is what I was told to do. Just let me try one more thing. If this doesn't work, we'll have to go to plan B. I shall just have to improvise for a few minutes longer without being able to show you the pictures. Can I just try one more thing? Hang on. Um, uh, that may help. Let me... Does that help at all? Uh, st we're still seeing you, Michael. No, okay. I think I possibly have to close this and then... Is there no possibility to do a screen share at that end? I don't have any of your content to share it. Uh, okay, hang on. I think in that case, what... My apologies for this. So all you can see at the moment is just myself in the uh, in, in in the coach house. That's correct. Oh, okay. I don't understand because when we did this rehearsal earlier, it's uh, allowed me to share the screen. Uh, hang on, minimise. Uh, just hold on a second. One thing I can do. <sighs> I don't want to do anything catastrophic and lose the connection altogether. Um, this is very frustrating. There should be a. The little double box that you see at the top right hand of the screen. Clicking on that uh, opens the presentation so, the file. Book. So one piece of advice, Michael, now that you're a co-host, try sharing again, screen yes, sharing. Yes, sure. That's exactly what it's trying to do. Okay. Hang on. I see, I hadn't realized you'd made me a co-host. That, that may explain the problem. Um, well, now I'm completely befuddled because I'm not quite sure what I... Hang on. Are you on a Windows computer or a Mac computer? I'm on a Windows. If you hold the Alt key and then push S, that should bring up the screen share menu. Right, thanks for that advice. Hang on. This is most frustrating, particularly after we did the rehearsal. Um, oh, damn. Uh, did you say the alt, the alt key and? The letter S as in Sam or Sierra. Yeah, I've got that. Uh, nothing happens. You may need to shift focus back to the Zoom window. Like if you just click in the middle of Zoom and then try it again. Yes, the trouble is I've got my, hang on, I think I probably need to close the, all I've got at the moment is the, is, is the file with the screen share in it. I don't understand why, hang on. Ah, oh, no, I've got it now, hang on. Ah, yes, I, it's okay. I think we finally solved the problem. Um, I'm so sorry about this. Now, that should... Now do you see them? We've got it now. You have, okay. My, my apologies. 
Okay, what you're looking at here is um, the appearance of uh, the part of the archive that is actually in the room that I'm speaking from. Um, and these um, storage boxes that you see ahead of you here, uh, they contain approximately 10 years worth of the old pre-digital recordings. Uh, from about 2010 onwards, all of the material in the archive has been uh, in video and it's all been recorded digitally. And I'll come on to what's happened to that uh, before the end of my presentation. Uh, but what you see there is um, the storage units for about 10 years worth of the material from 2000 to 2009. And uh, as you can see, there are about 160 of these units altogether. Um, there you can see the recordings ranged in them, stacked in them. Uh, and there you can see, as I say, you know, how they're shown. Uh, I'll just keep going through the, this. Uh, there, in fact, as a matter of interest, is a talk by Roger Penrose to the Israeli Academy of Sciences in 2005 for the uh, Einstein special relativity of uh, Annus Mirabilis centenary. Um, and so, okay, so this is the material which has all got to be digitized and um, put into a um, shape catalog. Um, these are the document boxes, a small portion of them. There are 150 of those altogether. The ones in blue have already been scanned. Um, the ones in pink and in the um, other materials that you see behind have uh, yet to be scanned. The ones in blue contain the documentation accompanying the recordings from 2000 to approximately 2016. The most recent ones from 2017 onwards have still, um, that documentation has got to be scanned. But those contain about um, half of the total archive documentation. And pairing that with the recordings, of course, is, is a large part of this project. Uh, again, just to give you a general impression of you know, what the document boxes look like. You, I uh, don't want to keep looking at document boxes, but those are the ones for 1998, those are the ones which have, um, have yet to be scanned. Now here, um, next door to the room from which I'm speaking, uh, is the part of Great Bear Recording Studios, uh, who will be working with us on the digitization project, uh, which shows some of the equipment that is involved. And this, for instance, is a array of... Um, the machines which will be used in digitizing the audio recordings and those are the controls which allow for the ones which need post-processing um, in order to enhance the quality of the recording uh, to be to be processed. Um, th they involve the use of a technology called CEDA which stands for Computer Enhanced Digital Audio Restoration which was originally pioneered in Cambridge in the 1990s and this has been since developed to a quite remarkable degree and which allows for the um, restoration of um, degraded recordings in almost any medium. Uh, we have tested and sampled the archive very carefully, of course, and we think that only somewhere around 5 to 8% of the recordings are going to need this kind of detailed restoration work. But as you can see, we, we do have the equipment to do it if needed. Um, this is, um, again, just more of the equipment in the Great Bear Recording Studio. That's one of the machines which will be used for the digitization and uh, restoration where needed of the video recordings. Uh, that's uh, what you already saw, the um, storage units. The ones which are missing there, that's actually an old photograph which was taken at the beginning of, of 2020, just before the COVID lockdown hit. At that time, we had two excellent young postdocs from the University of Bristol, um, one a pure mathematician, one working in, in physics, uh, who were working with us. And th that's Joe Allen, who was the um, maths postdoc. Uh, post um, and as you can see, he, he's working on cataloging and assessing um, the recordings uh, that were, were part of that 2000 to 2009 tranche. This is his colleague, uh, Tongchie Tongren, um, who uh, was a, is a physicist. Uh, they were working with us until, unfortunately, COVID blew down and um, put, uh, put a stop on everything. We are hoping to get them back. And certainly we have other people necessarily lined up to take their place. Uh, this is the appearance of the raw recordings from 2010 onwards, the ones up to 2009, the ones that you saw already in those storage units. This is how the uh, recordings that were born digital from 2010 to the present appeared a couple of years ago. 
they're all on these USBs and flash drives because that's how they were taken off the cameras on which they were originally recorded. This is all as they appeared in 2019, 2020. That's how they, they looked before um, I, I went to town on them. And I am glad to say that that's how they look now. They're all nicely tidied up into um, hard drives, um, very robust uh, transcend hard drives, uh, with three or four, four hard drives, each containing a complete copy of all the recordings for that particular year. So what you see there is all the recordings from 2012 to 2021 um, backed up in multiple form. And in fact, there is uh, there are three drives there for each year. And there's a fourth drive for each year, which is held in a separate location for security reasons. Uh, and those have been completely consolidated and catalogued and, uh, and, and, and weeded for duplicates and are substantially you know, ready um, to, to go online. They, they do involve, we do need to pair the documentation with them and we still need, need to do some more cataloging work, but we hope that within a matter of um, a few months, those will all be ready to go to Vancouver as part of the shipment of the first uh, tranche of, of the archive to, to Vancouver. Uh, that's just um, some recordings from 2008, actually with an extremely interesting um, discussion between uh, two eminent uh, mathematicians, Bill Lorvier and Pierre Cartier, which we recorded, which is uh, I'm digitizing at the moment. Uh, and those are just some more of the, um, uh, of the hard drives as they appeared when I was working on them. Um, last of all, uh, that's a RAID array. Uh, of which we will have four. Uh, RAID arrays, um, the, it's the, 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 the acronym sta stands for redundant arrays of independent disks. And it's a storage technology uh, for video and audio recordings, um, which allows for um, multiple you know, redundancy. Um, each of these units contains 10 hard drives, um, each of which is, and each unit is so configured that the entire archive can be held in one of these RAID arrays uh, in such a form that if one hard drive were to fail, uh, the rest of the archive would be recoverable. In fact, up to three hard drives can fail and you still won't lose any data. Uh, the chances of three hard drives failing more or less simultaneously uh, out of a set of you know, 10 high quality hard drives is extremely slight, but just to be on the safe side, we have we, we have three of these in each of which uh, eventually when all of the rest of the archive has been digitized, which of course is the big part of the project, which will take some three years, uh, the entire archive will be completely backed up. And on top of those three RAID arrays, possibly we will, will have a fourth for security held in another site and um, of course, uh, those will go to Vancouver. And in addition to that, we propose to have the whole thing backed up in the cloud. So short of a bolide impact of the kind that wiped out the dinosaurs, we hope it will be pretty durable. And I think at that point, I've probably said enough. Um, am I right in thinking that uh, if there are questions, they'll be in the uh, Q&A session a little later this afternoon? Is this working? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, we're still in the morning here, Michael. Um, uh, sorry, I meant to say the morning, of course. Yes, forgive me. But uh, the, um, what's going to happen is we'll have short questions now. Oh, okay. then, we'll have, then we'll have a refreshment break. And then a little bit later, uh, we'll be having more of a discussion. Um, so, but I think I'll, I'll take any questions now that people have. Yes, please. Uh, I'm more interested in the content of the sure. archive. Is there a link where I can find out what are the material? Like not yet, not not in its entirety, unfortunately. Uh, oh, hang on, sorry, I'm muted, aren't I? Um, am I muted? No, I'm not muted. Um, unfortunately, not yet, because the construction of the catalogue is actually a principal part of the project. We we do have parts of it. There are there are there are extensive fragments. 
of, uh, of, of there are individual years which are more or less completely catalogued. Uh, for instance, 2005, 2008, but at this point, not a complete catalogue. And what we want to do, of course, is to make the catalogue searchable by multiple fields so that it will be searchable by speakers, um, topics, keywords, uh, rather than just a bare chronology. Um, of, of, of course, um, what one might term the crown jewels, particularly some of the interviews that uh, we've done over the years, um, we, we hope those can be um, catalogued and put online ahead of the rest of the project. Do you have a, a top level summary, like what types of material? Is it mainly uh, sure. videos of lectures or interviews? It's or very, very varied. It's, it, it's immensely varied. It's videos of conferences, seminars, uh, lectures and interviews. And uh, these are on contra. These, um, very carefully prepared panel discussions, which we've been holding over the years. Uh, there is a top level summary of the material, which in fact uh, QGS has, has already uh, has seen, but um, I can send it uh, to you as a direct link if you let Philip, um, if you just uh, give your e e email your coordinates to Philip, I'd be happy to send that. There is a top level summary, but it's really just a bare description of what proportion of the archive is devoted to different topics, i.e., you know, how many hours of uh, general relativity, how many hours of quantum field theory, how many hours of foundations of maths, that kind of thing. Um, you know, the detail, the detail catalogue is, uh, and with an archive of this size, as I'm sure you can appreciate, it's, um, that's, um, that's quite a considerable task on top of actually having to digitise the entire thing, so it can be made available uh, online. So, um, but we are, we're gradually getting there. Uh, am I on? Yes. So actually, Paul Lee asked me to ask you if you could just tell us some of the names of the people who figure in the, particularly in the early portion. Oh, yes, of course. And I'm sorry, I meant to do that, but uh, I, I got sort of sidetracked into too much autobiography. Well, of course, Roger Penrose stands out naturally as the, uh, as the person who in, in many ways was uh, you know, a very strong inspiration right from the beginning. Um, so I have most of the seminars that he was giving in Oxford in that early period of, well, I say early period for me, of course, Roger had been going for uh, quite a long time before that. He'd been in Oxford for some 10 years, but the um, uh, material from 73 uh, onwards, there's a lot of his material. There's some material from Cambridge, including the, sem the DAMTP seminars, uh, when Stephen Hawking was still there, not so much. And of course, at that point, Stephen Hawking had uh, already more or less lost his voice and was having to communicate through, he hadn't actually had the voice synthesizer fitted at that point, but he was communicating mainly through his um, close colleagues like Gary Gibbons, who was just uh, relaying the questions uh, that he asked or the comments that he made in seminars. Uh, and then there is a lot of material from King's College, including um, se seminar courses, um, both lecture courses and seminars by Felix Pirani, um, David Robinson, and quite a number of other figures who were uh, Paul Davis, other people who were prominent in general relativity, um, quite a lot of material courses by Chris Isham, uh, who later went to Imperial College. This is just on the physics side. In On the mathematics and philosophy side, there's a lot of other material, uh, but I'm not sure how familiar the names would be. I think the reason that you're telling us about the very early material is that once the whole thing got going, you were capturing pretty much everything. So it's, it doesn't really matter which name one talks about, they're there. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would be, it would be too generous of you to say I was capturing everything. I mean, no one person could possibly hope to do that. You once kindly said, well, you know, I, I devoted my life to running around trying to catch every drop of rain that fell. Uh, <laughs> It, it, it was certainly a brave attempt. Of course, there was a lot missing. And, and of course, I mean, some of the material that's been recorded, I certainly won't say it was dross, but some of it was just, you know, very, um, let's say, um, Van Ordener lecture courses, particularly in some of the, um, uh, the early courses I attended. But um, I think I can say that we, we lucked out to an extraordinary extent in the timing of this, that I was recording stuff when a lot of very important things were happening. 
Uh, it was only much later that I became aware of just how remarkably lucky the timing had been in that respect. If I can illuminate the question a little more, um, I remember when I first looked at this uh, collection, and I believe that was in 2014, perhaps 2015, with an archivist, Christina Laszlo, you probably remember that, um, and she had to physically prevent you from playing two tapes, one by Stephen, one from a uh, recording of Stephen Weinberg uh, and the other of Stephen Hawking because she said those tapes only have one play. Yeah, yeah that's very true. Uh, and, and I remember that. Um, and I took that to heart. Uh, and those tapes have been very carefully set aside and they have been treated uh, so that they are now pretty robust. And, 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 and don't worry, they have actually been digitized and, uh, and backed up. They're, uh, the people, the people handling, actually physically handling the tapes here, do have great expertise in this area of handling very fragile and rare and valuable old recordings. And I'm glad to say they know what they're doing, even if I didn't back then. <laughs> yes, I also remember that one of the things that Christina pointed out was that the reason that there's such an enormous array of different kinds of equipment at Great Bear is because you have to be able to play material from all different times. And of course, the equipment that was being used in 1970 no longer exists. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> there are any number of stories to be told about that, but yes, indeed. Uh, some of the machines, in fact, which they hold um, are now, uh, well, just tell a very, very quick story. Uh, NASA needed, uh, that's to say the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, uh, a few years ago wanted to recover some uh, tapes which they had made back in the early 60s of interviews with some of the astronauts, but also um, with other people who were involved in the Mercury and the Gemini program. Uh, and they discovered that the machines on which these things have been recorded back in about 1960, 61, uh, I mean, there was literally nothing left in existence which could play these things back. And in the end, they went to the National Academy of Sciences and they paid for the equipment to be back engineered so that these could be played. Astonishing. Um, Adrian holds machines which are probably worth now on the open market $150,000, which were literally thrown onto skips 10 years ago by the BBC in Bristol. So there's an interesting story there. But uh, I think I have probably taken up uh, more than my share of time. 